Welcome to it. This is Know Your Power, the podcast series brought to you by VW Amarok. And over the course of this series, we want you to discover the man that is Siabela Sunatla and help you tap into what real power is. All 10 episodes are live right now. So find them by clicking the link in the bio of your favorite podcast app. Siabela Sunatla, the rugby player, the entrepreneur, the mentor, and of course, at some stage, the student. Siabelo, uh, of course, uh, embodies something which I absolutely love, is that uh, we all need a lifting hand. We all need a helping hand uh, to get to the final destination. And in this episode, I want to talk about a man who is clearly very special to Siabelo, the great, the one and only uh, Coach Paul Triu. Uh, Siabelo, what's happening first and foremost, buddy? I'm good. I'm good, my champ. How are you Yeah. You know what? I'm winning. I want to tell you. Winning, baby. I'm winning. Winning, baby. I'm with a winner. We're going to talk about a winner. We're going to talk with a winner. And um, the great the great poultry. I think great is a word that's overused today because I see on social media all the yeah. time, the goat. Yeah, the goat. I, I'm like, oh, the goat chat. The goat chat takes me off. Because yeah, that's that's a heavy title, that. There can only be one goat. That's that's a heavy title. Am I right? wrong? No, th- literally, you're right. <laughs> there can only be one goat. Can't be the... I mean, the greatest of all... Like, there's only one. Yeah, no, it is overused. I agree. But the word great, when it comes to one Paul Trio, I think, is apt. It is apt for um, what he did for this country, what he did, uh, of course, specifically for you. I want to come to that. But but I looked at him and I, I saw, you know, somebody who I hate and love at the same time, and I don't use that word often, is Sir Alex Ferguson, but I saw something like that when I saw him with this sternness and that, you, you know, he had that coldness even to the media, the way he spoke. <laughs> I, I I have a hate and love relationship with Paul too as well. So like, you're not the only one. But <laughs> that man has stretched me to depths that I really didn't think were available to me or accessible to me. Yeah. But he he, he was able to do that. And also gracefully um, by being hard at me yeah. or with me. But also having some sort of compassion at the other end. Um, it's a weird mix, but it works. You say it's a weird mix because I see you obviously um, being di- as dynamic as you are, and 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 being such a extrovert. You, you you know, and you're also you're you're out there. You're you're social. You're, and then you meet somebody like Paul quite early on. Uh, what was your personality like back then? And then um, when you met him, did it change? It. I think it changed while we were in the process of learning about each other. When I met Coach Paul True, yes, I was still an extrovert um, to a certain degree, but within a confined space, people that I'm very comfortable with. Um, but outwardly to the world, I was a little bit shy, a little bit shy. Like, um, obviously, the extroverted side it was like, hey, dude, let me out. So the first time, the first words he's ever spoken to me, that guy was like, you're not doing that again. Guess what I did? <laughs> really? <laughs> That's the first thing he said to me. So, and, and what was it? Like a, in, in a game or in, a, in practice? Or? It was, he was not even there. He was not even my coach to begin with. So he called me, he called me to invite me for a camp. He's like, yo, obviously like, okay, that's not like, Tim is not the first thing that he said to me, but he called me to obviously introduce himself, like, this is what it is, whatever, whatever, whatever. I want you to come to camp. Like, very, um, not even like in a, not trying to make conversation, like, straight to the point, I'm inviting you to this camp, we'll send you your details. Pa, gone. Oh, so no, how are you doing? What did you have for supper? Gone, gone. Less than a minute conversation. Wow. Which is one-sided, by the way. <laughs> I'm, oh. just, I'm just saying, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And then I get to, I get to Stellenbosch for the camp. Greets me. Uh, good, good, good. Everything good? Travel what? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, cool. Takes out his laptop. That's when he said, you're not doing this again. Oh, wow. <laughs> so he, he showed me a video. Of you? Because Guess what I did? I want you to guess what I did. A sidestep and you didn't pass? No, 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 no. <laughs> I had scored, I think it was my fourth or fifth try. They was playing for cheaters and between ones. Uh-huh. And I hit a backflip. Oh. <laughs> I hit a but it's like, firstly, not doing this again. Wow. And pretty much that was the last time I did that um, prior to this new episode I'm having now with the front flips. 
<laughs> oh, you re releasing. Yeah, but at least it's not back because it's fun now. So maybe it's accepted by him this time around. So he said, you. So he, I, I love that. He wasn't even your coach. No. Nah. It was under 21. No, nah, I was playing for Antonio Cheaters. Antonio Cheaters and yeah. I was invited for seven scam for a week. It had nothing to do with rugby. And he said, you're never doing so that you're again. You're never doing that again if you want to play for this team. How did you feel when you... So, so what? Because obviously you spoke to him on the phone and you thought, hey, how did you feel when it's basically the first instruction he gave you as a coach? I was like, yo, this is so hectic. Like, <laughs> what about expression, yo? What about expression? But as I got to know him quite a lot, he had this phrase um, that goes by the name of Nelson. It was the Nelson call, he called it. So the Nelson call was something that he portrayed as you're not showing any emotion or anything for that matter. You don't show anything. You don't show when you're tired. You don't show when you sad. You don't show when you're happy. You don't show when... You don't show anything, basically. You just keep a standard way of being, which is neutral. And he derived that statement or phrase or saying from the great Nelson Mandela, the GOAT. The now that it's applicable. <laughs> applicable. The aptly named GOAT. The goat. He 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 derived that statement from or that phrase from the goat himself. You know, like when he was in prison for twenty seven years. Obviously, those are harsh conditions, but the man showed nothing, mm. even though that he was suffering so much. So the Nelson call was that. That's awesome. And as I got into know and being the system, I understood why he was saying I must never do that again. He didn't even explain himself. He said, "You're not doing that again if you want to play for this team." Wow. Because that's hard hitting. You, you, you know. Bro, I'm, I'm coming there. I'm thinking, okay, I just scored five tries. Yeah. You know, I'm He's going to show me the video. You know, I'm going to come in there with like, eh, okay, nah, like I've, I've got an opportunity. Yes, I'm, I'm nowhere yet, mm. but I'm coming here with a sense of confidence. You know, that I just come off a bat from like scoring five tries. Um, I'm going to get there. I'm going to blow his mind. That's my type of thinking. You know, this, I'm going to blow his mind. I'm going to do everything to blow his mind. And then the first thing you get from a coach he like humbles you badly. Like you just sit down like, that's the first blow, pa. Immediately you step out of that and you you get to a place where you're like, you, your feet are on the ground again, which is what I appreciate about him. Because he always used to preach this, this saying, like no matter if we lost or won um, a tournament, it doesn't really matter. You have 24 hours to get back to zero. He used to call it zero. Mm. So he brought me back to zero. Zero is a place where you're operating... Um, when you're operating via processes instead of results. And obviously <clears throat> with processes, there's things like you have to start again, like start working hard again, start putting in um, what you put in when you were successful. So it's that base that you always bring, that you always bring yourself back to, which is zero, to be able to go out again and achieve what you've achieved or even more than that. And, you know, what role do you think he played in you uh, becoming... So the, the man is one thing, but in you becoming the rugby player you you went on to become because you, you reached an echelon at a stage where it, it was actually... It was a little bit outrageous. I was watching you and I was like, okay, we're winning, but this guy's too good. I, I kind of resent him a little. <laughs> you, you, I mean, you, why you, did you... We're winning, so why are you resenting me? Yeah, but, you, you, you know, uh, my cousin has a saying. People want you to do well, not too well. <laughs> you know what I mean? There was a stage where it felt like you weren't oh. human. And now, you know, you know what I mean? It, yeah, My no, insecurity get, came out. No, I get, I get what you mean. Um, I, I was like that with someone like uh, Leo Messi. So I was like, it just looks too easy now. It's too much. Yeah, like now it's just like this guy's playing around kind of. It didn't feel like that with me. But I guess like to the outside world, like obviously I was still working hard. I was, you know, doing whatever I do. Yeah. But it just... There was a point where every single time I touched the ball, I scored. So I get what you're saying. But you don't just get there. Like, like I, so I don't believe in luck in life. And I'd, I'd like to know what you think. Them again. You meet this this man. Is the talent was obviously obvious to him, which is why, you know, it's it's quite easy at that time to take it personally. And as you said, as your relationship grew with him. But what role do you think he played in you becoming that guy where you made it look that easy? Because you don't get there uh, just, just mucking about. I think one thing that that I like about myself is. Even till this day, I'm very coachable. Mm -hmm. So even when he came to me with that blockbuster, <laughs> <laughs> with that blockbuster statement, 
I didn't take it personally. I never take anything personally. I understand that coaches are there to make us better, right? So I come with that mentality of being a sponge and taking in as much as I can. And because I was like that, I allowed him to be my director. Because yes, the talent was there, but I don't think it was as developed as he made it out to be at the later stage in my life. You know, like um, he literally just sharpened a whole lot. He sharpened my individual skills by a mile. Mm. You know, the talent was there, yes, but it was raw. Like I, I'd like to, if I can put it in simple words, without alluding too much to it and getting too technical, I think I was the rough diamond. He polished the diamond and made me a diamond. Mm, mm. And, you, you, you know, when you see, when I think about it now, the way you've put it, it kind of reminds me of a terrible team called Manchester United. <laughs> But there was a time, deep hey, you don't know, they ruined my childhood. But there was an interesting relationship that developed in the Premier League. I don't know if you remember it. There was a guy called Eric Cantona mm. and the great Alex Ferguson. And everyone said when he took him from Leeds, that's never going to work. Look at this guy, popped collar. Now, you know, Fergie's, Fergie's squashed Paul Lentz. He squashed gigs. He squashed all of these greats to make them a, a part of just a machine. And they said, nah, this Cantona thing's not, not going to work. And when I think back, I, I almost think of your raw talent almost being like that. It's almost uncontrollable. For, but for you he, to make it work with him. He did that. Like exactly how you explained it, he did that. And at the time, it felt like he was, he was limiting me by putting me into a structure mode. And I've chatted about this in my life, like being in a bigger box, but still operating. Got you. The freedom and structure. Yeah, 100%, but still operating very open inside that box uh, with a smaller box. You know, he brought a lot of structure into my life. And then later on, I understood, okay, this is what this man was trying to instill. And I could go out with that structure. And then I developed that, you know, I gained the confidence to be myself and go back to my instinct. Uh, but still operate. You know, that's a learning thing. Like, you don't just get it in, in one year or like in six months or like within one practice. Like, you develop, you know... You develop things like that. You get confident and you know more as a player. And um, with that certain structure that he's pretty much put in place, um, I could branch out and be pretty much everything and who I am, um, but still re remain within those realms because those realms are kind of like your protection. Um, and they're like your, your fallback too when everything is not working. I got you. So like he, he provided that for me. He provided um, a back wall that or something, a backboard that um, can pretty much protect me when my instinct doesn't work. I got you. Then I'll go back to being more structured and I know that will work. And speaking to the man he is holistically, what are the three characteristics, when I say the name Paul True, that come to you immediately about him? Disciplinarian. Mm -hmm. um, chase of greatness, so hunger. And technical, so he details are everything to him. Details guy. He, like, yeah, he's a very heavy detail person. So the the, the small details matter, the 1%, as he calls them. And tell me, for you, with being a, being a talented sort of extrovert, generally, you, you details, you, you kind of... That, that's the things that I don't focus on. You see, mm. like, but you see how, why he was good to, uh, for me. I got you. For me. Is the fact that I wasn't that person and he instilled that that in me. Um, still not changing who I am, but having a piece of that. By having a piece of that, I can be more special because I understand why I can do the things that I do. You know, it comes from a place of knowledge and not just um, instinctively, as we call it. Yes, I'm instinctive, but it's calculated. I'm not instinctive from a place of just trying um, something like Hail Mary. Hail I Mary, you. I'm not just Hail Marying everything. Everything is calculated and it's it's trained. You, and you you know what he created for you guys, and ultimately I say he, you guys created it because we know it's a team sport. Coaches coach, players play, is what you guys created. I'm always interested to know, and maybe you could let us behind the the Ketin Hanyanifel, is to say, how did he treat his top guys, your Kyle Browns and those guys? Because I would imagine with somebody like that, having never obviously um, worked with him, but is that he'll set the tempo by sometimes coaching you young guys through the the sort of top stars to make sure that you guys know that, hey, even this guy 
is held to a certain standard. How did he treat those top guys for you guys to learn the lessons? With him, I don't think there's anything like a top guy. Oh, wow. Um, everybody has the same top type of treatment. Um, no one is put on a pedestal. And I guess that's why the seven system works so well because we don't have um, a seniority type of system. Like no one, it doesn't matter if you played 100 games for the Blitz Boko, one game, everybody's treated the same and we all are counted to the same thing. So simple example, filling up bottles. We're all filling up bottles. So no, no one, junior. No, no one is excused to not filling bottles. Yeah, no junior, junior, senior, whatever you want to call it in the context of um, other environments. In that environment, we're all filling up bottles. We're all contributing. There's yeah. no junior and senior. If you want to say something, you, you're most welcome to say something. Because Whether you, it's your first game, your first day, your whatever. Sometimes we forget that there's only seven of you guys in the field. You are the greatest South Africa has produced in that field, right? These are alpha dogs. You guys are alpha dogs. And ultimately, you've got to keep alpha dogs on a leash. Otherwise, that sort of power, and I love to, what we're talking to is, you need that guy to say, you guys are alpha, because all of you are them boy dogs, as they say, mm. you know, is that I love what he did for you guys. Like you said, that structure, that freedom and structure that he created for yes. all the different personalities. You, you know, later on in your career, would you say you're appreciating what he was doing for all of you guys and, and for the team? Way more than what I did. I actually thought when he was doing it, I didn't understand the way that he operated. But having been around and and I've seen some stuff, I understand how ahead of his time he was. Amazing. He was so ahead of his time. And everything that he did, he did with so much thought and um, with the intent of obviously not just doing it for now, but it being um, or forming something that's going to have a certain uh, length of of comparability until, you know, it pretty much will be. I, think, I don't think it'll ever break down even. I think it's going to, something that's so sustainable. He was thinking long term more than anything. So obviously, <laughs> something I keep thinking about, obviously, um, and I'll repeat it again, is one of the, probably the greatest thing you've said to me is that drip is forever. Drip is forever. Have you been on the drip game since then? I'd love to know, what what, what did the team think <laughs> back then? And did Paul, uh, the great uh, Coach True, did he ever say anything about your drip or wanting you to wear team tracksuit? What's this guy doing? <laughs> now we, obviously within the, the team realm, we always we were like, we always look the same. Yeah. So we call it uniform. I got you. We literally look the same. He was one of the first people to enforce that. It's like, we all have to look the same. So that no one feels important or no one feels a lack or what. We always have to look the same. We wear the same thing when you're traveling. We wear the same thing when the when you go eat. When you go eat, you doing in the hotel. Yeah. When you go eat lunch or breakfast or whatever the case may be, we are all wearing the same thing. And this is the time when you know those basketball. Yeah. <laughs> those basketball vests were coming in like. A team like New Zealand would be like Buma, Steph Curry, and you just like chilling there, Buma, LeBron James. Yeah. You and all these people, but, and you don't understand what this man is trying to do. But now I do because I'm much older and I uh, know a little bit more. You go eat breakfast, we all wearing the same thing. Lunch, we all wearing the same thing. Dinner, and, and he was like, he was creating a machine almost. We were like a unit, and that's why we became so close. We looked as one, we operated as one, wherever we were. Hey, was the micro napping thing true? <laughs> Very true. <laughs> Very true. Really? Very true. Very, very true. I, re I remember reading about that and I thought, nah, man, micro naps, you guys are sleeping on, on what? On the tackle bags? Okay. <laughs> My man, I promise you, you sleep on whatever you can find at the moment. Yeah. Um, because obviously, like, it contributes to recovery a whole lot and nothing is, nothing beats sleep. So you, you do do that. What, on whatever you could find. So for those who don't know, um, in the Coach Trio, it was in the Coach Trio era, mm -hmm. where, again, the little details is, what was it? Every seven-minute naps, five-minute naps, or what was it? We used to we used to take about seven. And it was every day, like, we used to do yoga first. We used to do yoga. So we like, we'd have, always have, like, yoga at, like, six or something like that, like, crazy hours of the morning. <laughs> to be like, yo, this dude, this dude is trying to kill us, man. <laughs> What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> at yoga at six, cold, man, cold. You're doing yoga, and then the last, like, 10 minutes, I take a nap. Like uh, kindergarten children. Yeah, like, 
we Charles Pose, when you hear Charles Pose, you're like, yes. <laughs> I've been waiting for this moment for so long. So what do we do? Take a nap and then he'd wake you guys up? Or how do yeah, it's like, okay, look, let's go now. That is outrageous. Well, but like it's it works so much. That's amazing. It works so much. Like he used to like do outrageous stuff, man. Like very unconventional. Stuff that just makes you uncomfortable but grows you as well. So, um after the yoga thing, there was a thing where we were swimming. Six o'clock in the morning we're in the water. Yeah. Like for breath works and stuff like that. Breath holds, doing breath holds. It's things that people are doing now and people are thinking. Jeez. Yeah, they're innovating. I'm, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm so, I'm like, I'm so exclusive. I'm innovating something new and new. Te- no, that guy has been at it, making us do stuff in the water, like carrying like big weights in the water. The whole team's carrying. He's been doing stuff like that. We didn't understand because like there was no relation to rugby at that point. It's like, why are we doing this? Yeah, why are we doing breath work? Little did you know. Little do we know the the little tunnel, uh, not the tunnel, the huddle thing that we do. Um, during halftime of breathing in, introduced by him. Yeah, look at everybody's doing it now. See the, the great, and and the he great. never he never advertised it. The, no, it's always like that's. Um, I feel like it's so sad because I feel like he's he's not celebrated enough. He's an unsung hero with, uh, with, when it comes to that sevens uh, program. He literally built everything up. Now, I I don't think I want to end, underestimate this before we uh, cross over to the coach. Is that that phone call, I would imagine, as you look back, changed the course of your life Literally. forever. Literally. Take me through your emotions. Number one, the phone call. And now now we know what he said to you. <laughs> Number one, the phone call. But on your travels there, what's happening in your mind? This was a period of my life where I had to be responsible. I just became a young dad at the age of 17. This phone call call happened when I was 19. So when I got my boy, my dad, I had a conversation with my dad and my dad was like, dude, it's time for you to step up now. You have to be responsible. I'm not going to do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. You a man now. You have to be responsible. You have two choices that you can make. You know, you can choose to be responsible or you can choose to run away. I know what I've put you up to do. And then I chose to be responsible. So when I got the phone call, I couldn't, at first glance, I couldn't believe it. I thought like someone was pranking me or something like that. I said like, yo, dude, this is what's happening. Especially, I think not not so much the, the phone call that I got to go to camp. The phone call that I got that he's coming to welcome to come sign me. That was the second, after like, so I got the phone call to go to camp. I went to camp, I came back. He said nothing to me until I went in... I went in um, like August. Heard nothing for after the camp. Heard nothing from the man, not a single word. For how long? He called me in November, the end of November. So August, September, October, November. That's call four me, months. Called me at the end of November. It's like I remember it was my final week of exams. I was doing first year studying accounting. Called me. It's like, hey, dude. Just literally just said, "I mean, I want to sign you." I'm like, what? Like, I'm, I want to sign you. I'm coming to Bloomfield tomorrow, and I'm going to sign you. So in my mind, I'm thinking, what prank is this? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I was like, okay. Like, not believing it. Hey, man. Yeah, like, I, I, pro- I didn't tell anyone. I'm in Valco. No, at that time, I was in Bloom. Yeah. I was signing in Bloom. I didn't tell anyone. I didn't take, you know, take anything out of it. I was just, like, chilled. It's like, okay. In my mind, I'm saying, like, one away. Yeah. yeah. It, if it really happens, this thing. And there's no translating that. <laughs> yeah, I can't anglicize that. There's no translation. There's no subtitle. <laughs> if you know, you know. Uh, yeah, so I'm, I'm chilling there. He called me. I'm like, sharp. Carrying on with my life. Like, nothing happened. I'm taking, you know, I don't take this thing seriously. Yeah. Go back to, to rest. Go study. Um, The next morning at eight, the man calls me. Him and away you dog. I'm I'm in bloom. Where are you? I want to come to you now. Now it's getting real now. <laughs> it's, it's like this man is here now. Hey dog, my heart is beating. Mm. I'm I'm thinking about a lot of things. I'm thinking about a lot of things, but most importantly, the one thing that's on my mind is 
I have an opportunity now to take care of my boy. I'm thinking about my boy a lot at this present moment in time. So it gets to me, whatever, whatever. It's like, oh, dude, um, it is what it is. Like, I want to sign you for, I think it was two years. I want to sign you for two years, whatever the case may be. I'm like, my man, no offense, coach. Ish. Me, I don't have an agent. I don't have anything. I can't just sign things that I don't know. I'm 19. If I'm going to sign anything, we have to go to my parents and welcome. I'm sorry. It's like, okay, no problem. Man hires a car. Like, okay, let's Immediately. Go, let's go to Avis. We go to Avis now. We go to welcome, dude. All on the way. But it's so surreal. Like, it's... I, I don't want to even say anything on the in the car. Like, I, I'm just the most prop I've ever acted in my whole life. <laughs> <laughs> Everything. Yeah. I'm chilling like this, man. Um, Did yeah, you say so, a word? No, we, I can't even remember the conversation, but I was not there. I was not present. I'm with you. I was not... Whatever we were talking about, I was not there. I can't remember anything I said to the man in the car. I can't remember anything that he said to me in the car. I'm in my head. You're a single dad. You're 19. You're studying. And there's poetry... There. Driving you to your driving parents' house. Driving me to my... Crazy. Driving me to my parents' house because I couldn't sign this thing. Um, I call my parents like when we almost get to Falcom. I was like, hey, mom, dad, I'm with Paul, uh, Coach Paul too here. He says he wants to sign me. Can you meet at home, please? My parents are like, ah, sure. We meet at home. We get home. Um... Get there, he explains everything, chilling. We're chilling in the special room now. You know, oh, the yeah. One that's I, yeah. With the room divider. <laughs> the serious one. The serious... <laughs> they bring the nice china. I know that one. I know we're chilling that. in that one now. <laughs> Things are pretty serious, yeah. right? Yeah. So we're chilling in that one. My mom begins with saying, ah, oh, dude, now you got to finish school first, you know? And then that was asked to be excused. Oh, they said you need to. Yeah, yeah. Was, because I was like, I was like, no, man, like, you need to This is, I'm a national player now, type of thing. I don't, like, school is not important right now. I'll see it later. And now, like, I'm pretty emotional at this point because my mom is, like, being hectic. Mm. Like, now, yeah, let adults talk now. And then they chat, they chat for a bit. I don't know what I said in that thing. I was called to come back. And I was asked to sign. Wow. I signed my, I signed my, um, I signed my contract. He takes me back to Bloom because I still had another exam to write. So do you sign there and then? Sign in Valcom, dude. At my mother's house in that room. As you sign, table. what's your mother saying? Because she was against it. You left a conversation yeah. for adults in the special room. Well, like, I guess like, obviously he set them down and made them understand the magnitude. I, because I don't think they understood the magnitude of what is happening at that point in time. Sure. I don't think they understood how big it was. Just because of the way it happened. It was not like a... You know, it's been, it's a monthly, like it's been happening for months. Like it was supposed to, it just happened like that. T t tell me something before we move on. Because, you know, when a conversation, when adults, and for those people who don't know, if a black mother asks you to leave the room <laughs> to talk without you, trust me, I was that guy. And I'm talking about school. When teachers, what are yeah. you thinking when you're alone now? What's running through your head? Obviously your son, you were thinking yeah. about him, but what are you thinking? What are you? At that time and, and at the moment in time, I was thinking, Mom, please. Mom, please. Like, I was literally praying. I was like, yo, God, can you just let this woman see what a great opportunity this is? Mm. And obviously, they didn't know what I was thinking in terms of my son. Yeah. But that's where my head was at. Like, was like, just, like, just make her say yes, please. All the rest will figure out afterwards. And when you came in, was there any doubt in your mind? Because obviously your mom is is strong. You've told me about her. Is that was there was there were you kind of feeling what if she said no? Did, was did that? Nah, I could see the mood had changed. Oh, okay, I see. I could see like literally they just said, okay, you just sign. <laughs> like okay, <laughs> I sign, I sign. Um, he takes me back to Bloom. He goes back to Cape Town only one day because now this thing hasn't sunk in. So when we're in the car, this dude likes like Paul Two is very special. We're in the car. I've signed the thing now. He tells me, he says this to me. Now I'm thinking in my mind, hey, I've signed the thing. This guy came to fetch me. Most he, he really wants me. Yeah. That means like I'm going to play. Yeah, of course. Same time. Yeah. He says to me, hey, dude, you're not as big as I thought you were. He saw me. <laughs> He's like I was there at camp. He saw how big I was. Yes. Like you're not as big as I thought you'd be. We're going to condition you for a year. I'm like, what? Yeah. Like you're not going to play for a whole year. going to condition you a year. You'll play there other year wow 
He, he drove you all the way. He saw you. He picked you up at school. My man, he, I was there on camp before this. So understand, my, fr- my, my, my conf- I was very confused. Understand why I'm confused because I went to camp. You yeah. saw how I was. I'm not going to go in a space of, or lose in a space of what, three months. Yeah. Because I was still gymming. I was still doing I was, my fitness stuff. I was still conditioning myself. He says that to me. But he also studied psychology, that man. So he's very smart. Plays around with your mind. He wants to see how strong you are. Yeah. He tells me that. And then after saying that, he leaves, obviously, to Cape Town. So he leaves you with that thought. And I said, nah. He's created a monster now. Yeah, it's like, nah. He knew I'm what gonna, he was I'm doing. I'm going to play now. So he left, he left me with that deliberately. And I was I knew I was going to meet him, like, after that week. He wanted me to come after writing my final on Cape Town. And he, that's the first thing he asked me when I, when I came back at camp. Like, yeah, so, yeah. How do you feel about what I said? Like, are you ready for, for your journey? I was like, no, coach, I'm going to play. The beginning of next day, I'm playing. I said that to him. Yeah. He knew. Cause, yeah, like he, but like I was, he made me angry. He's like, yeah. why? I feel like I'm good enough now. Yeah. So why? Yeah. And that's time, like, dude, I was actually crazy to think that we had the Totten Bovani of the world. We had Cornel Hendricks. We have Stevie Hunt. We had Duran Isbell. We had Jumbo Lengo. Oh, Jimmy Wing. We were like, Six of us. Yeah. I just came in as a young man. I'm 19. I'm telling the, all these guys have played and they've done well. Telling him. And I told him, like, I want the number 11 jersey. What did he say? Like, we'll see. That's awesome. The man, like, he, he played, like, he knows he, which patterns to take with people. But yeah, he created a monster. And I, I got the 11 number jersey um, the next day. I made, I got the November 2012. I made my debut. In January 2013. And the rest is history. It took me a month to get the jersey. What's one thing he taught you about yourself, whether you realize it then or you realize it now, that you didn't realize before you worked with him? Greatness is a choice. Man. Greatness is a choice. You choose to be great. I mean, no one is born special. No one is born special. We all just creating ourselves. And <clears throat> if you really want to be, if you choose to be great and you really want to be great, it, it can be achieved. It really can be achieved because everything starts with choice. Yes, there are repercussions from the choices you make. And an accumulation of choices make your life. Greatness is a choice. It's a choice. You know, like if you... If you're very consistent at working hard, being dedicated and all that, you know, cliche stuff that we talk about, you're going to become successful. And if you're successful and you repeat the same process of all the things you're doing, dedication, whatever, whatever, you're going to be great. It's simple, Matt. It's very simple, but... One plus easy. one. It's very simple, but not easy. But he told me that greatness is a choice.